Take your Bibles, if you will, and look with me to the Gospel of Luke, the 19th chapter. <clears throat> Luke chapter number 19, if you will. We're going to deviate from our series in the book of Hebrews this morning and uh, deal with some events that are leading up to next Sunday. Next Sunday is Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day, and uh, you kind of think, okay, that's a week away. What was Jesus doing a week before the resurrection? What was he up to? Uh, what was going on in, in Jerusalem uh, during that time? And uh, we're going to be studying for a few minutes from Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse number 28. So I'm going to ask you to stand, if you will, and let's read the text together for a moment. Luke chapter 19, verse number 28. The Bible says, and when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying, go ye into the village over against you and the which at your entering, you'll find a colt tied whereon yet never man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, why do you loose him? Thus shall you say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, why loose ye the colt? And they said, the Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus and they set their garments upon the colt and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, uh, they spread their clothes in the way and when he was come nigh even now, at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King of that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. And he went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold therein and them that bought saying unto them, it is written, my house is the house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. And he taught daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes and the chief of the people sought to destroy him and could not find what they might do for all the people were very attentive to hear him. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, thank you for the privilege of opening up your word for a few minutes and listening as you speak unto us out of it. I pray, Lord, as you speak, that we'll see ourselves in the light of who you are so that we might become more conformed to the image of Jesus than we've ever been in our life. May he be lifted up. And in the process of that, may many come to faith in you. I pray this now in Jesus' name and for his sake and all God's people said amen. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> One of the things we're going to look at this morning are some of the things that literally need to be settled in the life and the ministry uh, of the Lord Jesus forever. We're looking at some of these last things while he was here on this earth. Now, the first thing that I want you to watch with me for a few minutes is simply the providential preparation of the Lord the providential preparation of the Lord. Notice with me, if you will, uh, back as we begin in that verse 28, 
Uh, he went up to Jerusalem, verse 29. Uh, he went down into that Mount of Olives. He sent two disciples. And then in verse 30, he said, I want you to go to a village. And over there, you're going to find a donkey that has never been ridden. And I want you to loose that donkey and I want you to bring him to me. Now, one of the things that immediately jumps out when you read those three verses, the Lord Jesus was not haphazard in anything that he ever did, unlike many of us. He made sovereign preparations. Uh, he looked ahead and decided there were some things that needed to happen, some things that needed to be done to accomplish what he had come forth to do. And so he was a man who was well organized. He didn't do anything haphazardly like us. I had an old boy come to me not, not, not too long ago and he said, Pastor, I've settled this thing about my giving. I said, what do you mean you've settled this thing about your giving? He said, well, yeah, you know, I, I, I've come to, to, to a belief that I know uh, how, to, how much to give God and how much I am to hold back. And I said, well, how, how is that? He said, well, every day, every Friday when I get my paycheck, I go to the bank and I cash it and I take the money home and uh, we, we, we go out on the deck and, and I just throw all of the money up into the air and what stays up there belongs to God and what falls back down, it belongs to me. That, that's kind of a haphazard way, isn't it? Uh, in figuring out what to give. But now notice in verse number 30. The Bible says that he said uh, in verse 30, go to the house uh, into this village and find a donkey that is tied up. He didn't say, I want you to go find a Ferrari. He said, I want you to go get this donkey. And where the king of kings, the lord of lords, royalty, the son of David, if you will, opted on his coronation parade that he was not going to come in uh, on a Ferrari or a Rolls Royce, but to come in on a donkey. You say, well, now, wait a minute, preacher. Uh, all of that just doesn't add up to me. It's just, it, it's just not matching up to what my perception of Jesus uh, is or should be. Well, it may not match up to your perception, but it really does match up to the spirit of his humility that every one of us in this room need uh, to emulate. Now, you, you hear my heart here a minute. He's riding in on this donkey not to preach a Christian doctrine of some of the extremes that you and I are seeing today. He didn't say if you come to Christ, you're always going to be poverty stricken. Nor did he say, if you come to Christ and be saved and receive God into your heart and in your life, that you will always be wealthy. Those are the two extremes. I, I was home uh, one Sunday uh, and, and, and I had the flu. And uh, so I was uh, going through the channels and just flipping to see what uh, kind of ministries were out there. And I stopped on one and, and I heard this preacher as he said, to his congregation, and there were thousands and thousands that were there. He says, do you see these $800 alligator shoes? He says, uh, all of you could have alligator shoes cost $800. Do you know that uh, very expensive Mercedes, the, the best that Mercedes has to offer is parked out there in my parking spot. All of you could be driving a Mercedes if you just had the amount of faith that you ought to have. So you got that extreme. You have the other extreme that says that if you come to Christ, then you're going to always, we, we flubbed up this whole theological mess here uh, about, uh, about what it means to come to Christ and how Christ expects us to live. Jesus was trying to allow the beast, the lowest of all of the animals that he rode, as a symbol of his life that he lived before the world. The, the word says that the birds of the air have nests that they can go to. But the son of man, Jesus himself, doesn't have any place to lay his head. Now, we, we know that he was also had trouble paying taxes. He didn't have enough money to pay his taxes. By the way, tomorrow is April 15th, isn't it? I, I didn't want to bring that up, but... You know, he told Peter, he said, I want you to go down in the water. I want you to catch some fish. And out of that mouth of the fish, half a shekel pay your taxes and a half a shekel pay my taxes. He didn't have enough money to pay his taxes. Man, let, let me just add something right here, parenthetically. 
Tomorrow is April the 15th. If me paying my taxes was dependent on my abilities as a fisherman, y'all would have to come and get me out of prison for tax evasion. I can just tell you that now. Not a fisherman at all. When he died, the only thing he had was a robe that his mother had probably given him. He didn't have a place with which to be buried. He had to be buried in a borrowed tomb, if you will. You see, the priority of Jesus was one that he wanted to show that in his messiahship, in his kingship, in his royalty, that, not, that, that it was not by the pluses of what could be done by the arms of the flesh could do, but because of who he was, he wanted to emulate that. Now look at verse 31. The Bible says, and if any man ask you, why do you lose him? Thus shall you say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. The Lord needs it, and that just settles it. So he is exercising now his, his authority over stuff. He's exercising his authority over things. He's announcing his lordship over everything that we think that we own. <laughs> you understand, when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you cross over a line at that moment that you acknowledge before God and before man that I don't own anything. You, you know, you think that you own that house that you left this morning. You think that you own the car with which you drove over here to church in today. You think that your IRAs belong to you. You think that money that is in your pockets this morning belongs to you, but I've got news for you. None of that belongs to you. It all belongs to the Lord. That, that's the word of God. You see, the, the, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness therein. In other words, it all belongs to him. I promise you there would be no Christian church in America today that would ever have any financial burdens whatsoever if we could just adhere to that principle that God, we don't own anything. It all belongs to you. Matthew and Mark give uh, accounts of this same thing too. And in Matthew and Mark, they said, you tell the owner that when the Lord gets done with it, it will be returned. Uh, we, we'll bring it back. Mark says that Jesus walked onto the boat one day and just acted as if it were his and said, hey guys, launch out into the deep. Let's get out uh, of this Harbor. He walked into Jerusalem. He entered into Jerusalem uh, as the owner and the operator. Can I just say to you that long before his death, long before his resurrection, long before his ascension, the Lord Jesus Christ had already been established as Lord over all. You know what? On April the 12th, 1970, 49 years ago this past week, I once and for all settled the fact I am not my own. I've been bought with a price. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Now let me give you number two. You ready? His powerful praise. His powerful praise. Watch this in verse 36. And as he went... They spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Uh, I was uh, taking my, my mom to the doctor this week and doc said, Pastor, what you preaching on Sunday? I said, well, I'm preaching on Palm Sunday. He said, well, I think that's pretty appropriate. And he said, by the way, I got a question about that I want to ask you. He said, when all of those people were putting their clothes down on the road for the donkey to walk on, well, what was that all about? Was that just for the donkey's feet so that he wouldn't hurt his feet, his hoofs on the rocky soil of that? Is that what? And I said, no, no, no. If you study the word, you'll find out 
that all of that was nothing but a measure of the sense of the royalty of the one that was on the donkey who was entering in uh, to the city. I love the Amplified Bible. If you don't have one, you probably need to get one. I want you to listen what the Amplified Bible says about this. In verse 36, and as he rode along, the people kept spreading their garments on the road. And as he was approaching the city at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to rejoice and to praise God, extolling him exultantly and loudly for all the mighty miracles and works of power they had witnessed, crying, blessed, celebrated with praises, is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, freedom there from all the distresses that are experienced as a result of sin, and glory, majesty, and splendor in the highest heaven. They got excited when Jesus came into town. They got excited when they came into his presence and they began to praise him. Now here's what's astonishing to me. They had been with him for three years, but at no other time did they unzip their soul and exalt him spontaneously like they did on Palm Sunday. Never before had they done that. Somehow they sensed that his teaching and his ministry was coming to an end. Somehow they got a glimpse that his earthly time was about to be over. And, and, and somehow they, they thought, okay, uh, we're not gonna be with him much longer. So unannounced and unbridled and unhindered, they just let it rip in honor and glory and praise unto him. I wonder if you could just see that in your mind for a moment. Can you just visualize it for a second? Can you just imagine how that it must have been? Now, may I say to you this morning, anytime people get excited about the Lord, anytime people get to praise in the Lord Jesus, anytime that there is a revival kind of spirit that's gonna break out, there are always going to be spirit quenchers. Inevitably, there are going to be some praise poopers somewhere along the way. Now notice, if you will, verse 39. And some of the Pharisees from the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke your disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you, if these hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out, wow. Here they go. Some of these Pharisees, these praise poopers, they got to looking and they thought, now wait a minute, that, that's not in my bulletin. I, I don't see that in the order of service anywhere. The, well, the seven last words of the church, we've never done it like this before. And, and so they came to the Lord and they, they, they said to the Lord, that this is not according to our tradition. Tell them to be quiet. Things are getting out of hand. Hey, may I say to you, in my travels and, and especially uh, just here at First Baptist Indian Trail, I'm watching God do something across the land that is extremely exciting. I'm watching him as he now, and I believe too with all my heart, it's because we're getting toward the end of the days. I believe that God is restoring the sense of unbridled, unhindered, uh, uh, unrestrained, and uncapped praises unto the Lord Jesus, where the name of Jesus is being lifted up, not denominations, not organizations, not programs, not denominations, and not organizations, but the name of Jesus is being lifted up. And praise is beginning to break out like never before. Won't you just imagine for a minute the Lord Jesus in the vestibule and all of a sudden the doors wide open. Imagine with me Jesus as he comes riding 
down the aisles of this church. I wonder what it would be like. Would we sit there? What's going on here? Or would we acknowledge the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, our Savior, our Redeemer, our coming King? Well, Matthew's account says that even the children got to praising. They were told to be quiet. The children were praising. Hear what they are saying. Just, just hear what these children are saying. Jesus said, out of the mouths of babes and sucklings has perfected praise. I got so excited a couple of weeks ago when I looked up into the choir and our children had, a join, had joined the adult choir and I watched as some little eight and 10 year old kids with both hands straight up in the air, their eyes closed before God and they were singing the praises unto the Lord. Perfected praise. Let me give you number three. It's his passionate perception. Notice verse 41, his passionate perception. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. But what did he see? I believe he saw the lying. I believe he saw the cheating. I believe he saw the broken homes and the misery, the heartache, the loneliness, the despair, the depression, the immorality, the breaking of all of God's principles, the violation of all of that, this broken, emaciated culture that was like sheep that did not have a shepherd. He saw the chaotic confusion that had absolutely covered the whole area. He saw fallen man and all that fallenness brings. He saw the bad in existence and what he saw and what he grieved over was with all of that going on the solution to everything they were facing was five feet away. This week I was sent a mug shot and I just, I thought, wow I couldn't hardly look at it. I looked into that young man's eyes and I looked into his face and I saw the emptiness. I saw the void. I saw the confusion. I saw the despair. I saw utter hopelessness. And I thought to myself, why are you looking in all of those wrong places? Why? Why? why, why? Are you searching in all of those crazy places looking for something that only Jesus can provide for you? You understand something? I am fully convinced with all of my heart that the solution to all of this world's problems is in nothing less than a personal, intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read verse 42, saying, if you had just known, even, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. If you only knew what would bring you peace. Let me help you something here today. I, I, I don't think that I need to probably educate you on something, but I pray that I can inspire you on something. You're never going to find peace in fame. You're never going to find peace in position. You're never going to find peace in drugs. You're not going to find it in the bottom of an alcohol bottle. You're not going to find it by getting more money for what you do. You're not going to get it through a vacation. You're not going to find peace in illicit sex. You're not going to find it in a bottle of tranquilizers. You're not going to find peace in some new hobby that you are adjusting your life to. When will this world understand? When will they learn that the Messiah sits over the precipice of time and he bleeds and longs for us and cries out, if you only knew what would bring you peace? I, I get burdened as a pastor so often 
when I watch the very people that God has called me to serve get beat up, get beat up by this world and everything that's in it. I heard about a boxer. He was fighting one night. His opponent landed a hard right hook right up the side of his head and split his eye wide open, blacked his eyes. His eye began to swell and the round was over. He goes over to his manager and his manager says, get back out there. He never laid a glove on you. He goes back out for the second round and the guy hits him with a, with a left uppercut and knocks his chin completely out of place. He hits him with a right cross and knocks his nose over him, just bends his, breaks his nose and it's all bent over to one side. The round is finally over. He crawls over to the corner and his manager says, get back out there. He didn't lay a hand on you. He didn't lay a glove on you. And he gets back out there for the third round and the guy uh, splits his other eye and, and, and it closes shut and blood streaming down and, and finally the round is over and he crawls over into his corner. His manager says, get back out there. He didn't land a glove on you. He says, I'm gonna go back out there but you keep, a, if he didn't land a glove on me, you keep your eye on that a referee. I, somebody's about to kill me. Mm. Have you ever felt that way before? Have you ever felt like you just beat up, annihilated, desecrated? Jesus said, if you only knew the things that would bring you peace. Let me help you with that for a minute. Would you listen closely? You want peace? Do you want peace? Take an honest appraisal of yourself. I've had it my way. I've been going in my direction. I've made my decisions. Look, look what that's got me. Take an honest appraisal of your life right now and where the decisions you've been making have brought you. Second, understand that the Lord Jesus Christ has paid your sin debt on Calvary's cross. Every sin that you've ever committed in your life can be covered by the blood of Jesus. It should have been you on that cross, but Christ took your place and paid your sin debt so that you could have this peace. And then understand that your security can only be found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Watch with me, if you will, verse 43. For the days shall come upon you, your enemies will dig a trench about you and compass you round and keep you in on every side. And they shall lay you even with the ground and your children with you. And they'll not leave one stone upon another because you knew not the time of your visitation because you didn't know who was riding through your city. You didn't know that I was really the source of life and strength and peace. You never acknowledged me as the Lord and Savior of your life. No wonder the word of God says that he came into his own and his own received him not. Let me just help you. You're gonna keep getting beat up and beat up and beat up until you get to the place that you acknowledge him as your Lord and as your Savior. So let me give you number four. I want to talk to you about his preferential prayer. Notice, if you will, verse 45. He went to the temple, began to cast them out that sold therein and them that bought, saying unto them, it's written, my house is the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Now, Matthew, Mark, and John give us some more clarity about what happened in that temple. Uh, Matthew tells us uh, that he went into the temple and he turned over the tables of the money changers and those that were selling the pigeons and the turtle doves. Mark tells us that the Lord wouldn't even let some of them leave the court. John tells us that he took a whip and he actually whipped the people that were in the temple at that time, driving them away. And he said, my house 
shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. Well, what does that all mean? Well, people were coming from all over the known world to make sacrifices and to offer sacrifices. Many of them would bring their, tu their turtle doves and, and their pigeons, but uh, there would be select people there that would examine them to see if there was any spot or blemish in them. And, and inevitably, they were going to find something so that they could sell them. You couldn't get the sacrifice if you didn't have the sacrifice for it. And they would sell them what would be considered spotless. They, they would come with their own money. And that would be a currency in a foreign place that didn't match the currency of the temple. And so they would have to exchange their money out. And oftentimes the money exchangers would charge them 1,500%. And so they had them over a barrel. Jesus said, by the way, it wasn't Jesus, little meek and mild, who said, consider the lilies how they grow. It was Jesus who came in and said, consider the thief how they are thieving in my house. Hmm. And he said something I believe that would be relevant even today. My house shall be called a house of prayer. I believe if Jesus were with us today, and we're standing before us today. Do you know what I believe he'd say? I believe he would say, I want my house to be a house of prayer. I want my house to be a, I want you to be a prayer warrior. First Sunday in January, we passed out those eight to 15 cards. I don't know how many of you have yours. I don't know how many of you filled them out. I can tell you, that the news of what God is doing through the 8 to 15 cards is spreading out all over the country. I've had numerous pastors from all over the country say, what is this 8 to 15 stuff? Tell me about this 8 to 15 stuff. I, I want to know more about that. I got a, a call from a pastor in New York. Never heard of him before in my life, but he said, I keep hearing about this 8 to 15. Share with me what that means. Because of the answered prayer, just Tuesday night, one of our deacons, uh, we were talking about our 8 to 15 cards and what God's been doing through the 8 to 15. And one of the deacons said, well, I put my granddaughter on my 8 to 15 card and I had the opportunity to lead her to Jesus. What word about prayer and the power of prayer. Folks have had eight Specific answers to prayer since January, seeking and pouring and crying out to God on behalf of somebody else. And I'm watching God do miraculous things. Preferential prayer. My house shall be called a house of prayer. Look at verse 47. He taught daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes and the chief of the people sought to destroy him. And he, listen to this and could not find, we don't know what we're going to, we're going to kill him, but wait a minute here. Watch, watch what's going on. We can't do anything to him. Everybody here is hanging on every word that he says. We can't. When we lift up Jesus, the one who's alive forevermore, the one who's conquered death, who's, Life is all authority and power. I want to tell you, when we come and we lift him up, when we take the word of God and we lift up Jesus, I promise you, people will hang on every word. The authorities couldn't do a thing um, because he spoke the truth about himself and he spoke the truth about those that were around him. And you know what the truth is? Without me, you can do nothing. Now, I, I don't know where you're trying to find peace. I don't know where you're expending your energies. I, I, I don't know what avenue that you're looking at right now to try to fill up some void that's in your heart and in your life. I, I can just tell you without Jesus, you're never going to find what you're looking for. And I plead with you and I beg you this morning, bring your life as a sacrifice unto God and lay it down at the altar and say, God, without you, I can't make it anymore. Bring your life to Christ. 
cast your life at the very feet of Jesus and watch him give you what you've been looking for all your life. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.